Hello and good day to you. My name is Brett Fuller. I'm pastor of Grace Covenant Church located in Chantilly, Virginia, right outside Washington, D.C. I'm also chaplain of the Washington Redskins, and I've been tasked with the responsibility of trying to help, help you understand a little bit about how we got to the place where we are with the ethnic tensions in our country. And before I do so, I'm going to give you a little, little insight into where I came from and how I got here. I've been in Washington for a little, little over 38 years. I grew up in Kansas City, uh, Kansas City, Kansas side. And my parents moved us from the inner city of Kansas City in 1966 to the suburbs on the Kansas side to a place called Leewood, Kansas. And uh, my father moved us primarily because the inner city was fairly dangerous. And he wanted to make sure his children were safe. My dad was a dentist. My mother was a uh, school teacher. I'm the eldest of three. And when we moved out to, to Leewood, Kansas, I was a uh, five-year-old. And so I was just entering into the first grade. We broke the color barrier in our neighborhood. Um, we bought a home from an owner. We couldn't buy from a, from a realtor because no realtor would sign us as a client. Uh, why? Because we were black. 60s weren't a good period for black Americans. Well, for that matter, neither were the 50s or the 40s or the 30s or the 20s or try two centuries ago or three or four. They haven't been very good for us for a really long time, like since the beginning and the founding of this nation. Even the idea with colonists coming from Europe, it hasn't been very good for us. In 66, my dad bought from an individual owner in Leewood, Kansas. And he had to pay about 30% more than the house was worth just to get his kids in a nice neighborhood. We had no welcome mats laid out for us. They egged our house regularly. In fact, we may have had, in the first year, more eggs on our house than in our house. They teepeed our home. They burned crosses. Well, at least one we know of. I found about it later. My mother and father did not tell me, but um, I found about it later found out about it through a paper, a local paper called the Leewood Sun. They didn't burn it in our front yard. They burned it in our neighborhood. I was the first kid, obviously, to break the color barrier in my elementary school. And I can remember the, the looks on the kid's face when I first came in the room. I didn't know what it was, but it was obvious they didn't like me. <laughs> Maybe it was because their parents had been seen on TV these black folk that were walking in the streets and protesting and trying to fight for equality, though in peaceful manners, and the police were unloading on them with dogs and, and, and water cannons. And their interpretation in their home was that these black people are destroying the nation. And so when they saw me, they identified me with that, and it wasn't a warm welcome. I did have an angel in school, though, my first grade teacher. Wow, what a woman, Mrs. Haig. I remember her like yesterday. She was like a, a beautiful grandmother to me. She came uh, to my house every week to give my mother a progress report on how I was doing. It was a hard transition. I thought that's what all first grade teachers did, and that's what she did for every kid <laughs> in my class. But no, it was just for me. Bless that woman. Got into a lot of fights, lost most. Everybody knew my first name, but for some reason... They chose to call me other things. My dad wanted us to swim in the swimming pool in the community. And so he appealed. And obviously they said no. So a week later, I saw a bulldozer in my backyard. Didn't know what it was for. I said, Daddy, what in the world are these big truck things doing in my backyard? He said, you can't swim there. You're going to swim here. We were the first house in the neighborhood with a swimming pool. My dad was great. He was great. And although it was rolling through my mind as to why in the world he thought moving me from the inner city, though it was dangerous, to the suburbs of Kansas was a safer place, I didn't know how to articulate that. I just knew that it was really, really, really hard for me. See, at five, I didn't know how dangerous it was in the inner city. But I knew how dangerous it was where I was because every day I had to go to school with people who didn't like me. And it was hard. And a five-year-old has a hard time trying to rationalize, why in the world do my parents think this is better? This is hard. I'd come home from school crying. I don't like it here. Can we go back, please? 
and his people would not treat me well, and I couldn't figure out why. I mean, my parents didn't tell me every day I was black. They didn't. It wasn't one of those things, though they taught me a whole lot about what it meant to be proud about my heritage and, 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 and my history and my, 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 my relatives who had suffered so uh, uh, hard and difficultly in the South. I didn't, I didn't get it at five. And every time I come home with some complaint or tears, they say, baby, it's going to be okay. It's going to be okay. They never said a word of bitterness, never were angry. I never heard a cross word come out of the, their mouths regarding white folk, ever. They always just said, it'll be okay. It'll be okay. They taught me, without opening chapter and verse, in a Bible, what it meant to be forgiving and accepting. My mother, though, would make sure that we would have some really intentional points of education that she knew we were not going to get in the white suburban schools. And so, as an educator, she would make sure that we were up to snuff on all of the history that was omitted from where I was going. So what we would call it today is African-American history. I learned about Phyllis Wheatley. We had to memorize her poems. Phyllis Wheatley was the first African published author in America. I don't say African-American because she wasn't in America. America would not allow that in the 1700s. No black person could be a citizen. And so she was a descendant of Africa, indeed a slave. We also learned about Benjamin Banneker. What a man. He was the guy that picked up the pieces when La Enfant, who happened to be the, the French architect, who, who really pinned all of what Washington, D.C. should look like. He's the guy that wrote down the plans. Uh, but, but our government, America, ran out of money and couldn't pay him, so he went back to France. Benjamin Banneker happened to have been his assistant here. Benjamin Banneker remembered the plans that La Enfant took with him back to France. I guess he had a photographic memory. And as a result, this Benjamin Banneker, an African, rewrote the plans for the city we now call Washington, D.C. And the, the reason it is planned the way it is is because Benjamin Banneker remembered what La Enfant had designed. We learned so much. My mother made sure it was driven down in our soul. George Washington Carver and what he did down at Tuskegee Institute, my goodness. I didn't know you could get so much from a peanut. And this was, this, was, <laughs> this was a man who had very little resources down there because Tuskegee University now, Tuskegee Institute back then, didn't have a lot of money. It was an HBCU. And this man, who had many opportunities to go all over the country and teach and, and do research, decided to stay here because he cared about his people. And what a man, in fact, uh, uh, Ford, uh, who was uh, the founder of Ford Motor Company, offered him a job. He said, no, I'm going to stay right here. Booker T. Washington, who founded Tuskegee Institute, what a man, just went through all kinds of stuff to make sure the black people could be educated. My mother taught us. And so we gained while I was losing in school. Came out one day, Mama used to take us to school because she didn't trust our safety in our walking to school. We were only a half mile from school. We could have done that. But for the first four years, from fifth, first grade to fifth grade, she took us to school. And my dad had, had bought her a beautiful 1964 ragtop cherry orange Mustang. Now, if you know anything about cars, that's the only one that's ever been made. Everything else is just an upgraded version of Fred Flintstone's little footmobile. 64 Mustang? Oh, my goodness. Beautiful automobile. As we were coming out to go to school one day, we came out and the car had been destroyed. Sledgehammer taken to the hood. A knife taken to the ragtop roof. Seats torn out. Doors pulled off the hinges. All the windows smashed. Tires slit, totaled. Why? Just because we were black. And those are just some of the stories that help frame how I got here with the mindset that I do, because I'm not bitter. I'm not angry. I'm not content. I'm not satisfied. 
I'm self-aware constantly, knowing that wherever I go, I am a black man in a white world. When I go in a department store, I realize I've got to make sure that I don't put my hands in my pockets, lest the people who are watching on camera, or later watching on camera, just looking at film, and they realize somebody stole some, they might not, they, 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 they aren't going to accuse me because my hands are open. I realize when I am moving throughout America, when, it, when, when a police officer might stop me for a perceived violation. Now, let me say this. I really like the police. I know I'm in the outs. I'm, I'm on the fringes of this, but I, I think they're necessary. But many of them have not treated me nor my family well. Again, I'm not bitter. I'm just aware. I know what I've got to do. I know who I have to be, the kind of person I must be to not be to not put them on the defensive, to not, to not make them heightened in their attention. My mother and father helped me a lot. And as a result, it kind of primed me for the kind of world that I now live in. Not just the world of America, but the world of my church. I pastor a congregation that is very multi-ethnic. It is um, black white, Latino, Asian, and just about everything in between. We've actually got a Korean congregation that meets in our house, in this church building. And he's on our staff. I'm his pastor, he and his dear wife. We've got a Latino congregation that meets in this church building. He and his wife are on our staff. We've got to learn to be multicultural and multilingual in our house. We've got demographic changes. We have uh, uh, the strata, old people like me, 59 and above. And then we've got some 22, 23, and 24-year-olds that are running stuff and doing a fabulous job. You look on our website, you look at our staff, you think, my goodness, who in the world are they? My mother and father primed me well so that I might be prepared to do this. They didn't know I was going to be a pastor. I surely didn't know. In fact, pastoring was probably the last rung on my occupational ladder list. I did not want to do this. But God called me, and for that I'm very grateful. And when he did, I said, God, if you ever give me the privilege of pastoring a church, please let it look more like heaven than like me. And he's done that. But we didn't come to this kind of multi-ethnic multi -ethnic expression simply by accident. We came to it because we decided to. We, we have architecture that allows us the privilege of building this way. Now, it's hard to do because you've got, you've got currents that are cross-cultural in their orientation that are constantly going against one another. And we've got to figure out how in the world to weave together a tapestry that allows everybody to feel at least safe, maybe not comfortable. Meaning when you come in our house, there's nothing about this environment that, that, that makes you feel like home. Because nothing like this in, in, in most of the places where people grew up exists. Black folk are looking for a lot of choirs that sway from side to side and me to do some hooping. And I'm not talking about the kind of hooping that you coach. I'm talking about the kind of hooping that comes from the pulpit. They're looking for some kind of ethnic expression that allows them to feel like they're home. That doesn't exist here. White folk are looking for whatever makes them happy. That doesn't exist here. We do crossover. We do the, 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 the compilation, the synergy of different cultures coming together so that everybody at some point can find something that reminds them of where they were, but not exactly everything that reminds them of where they were. And it's hard to build like this. <laughs> and most, in my profession, most church growth books will tell you don't because you can't build a big church and you won't last. It's just too hard. People fight about their, their expectations of what church ought to be. I said, so I'm going to build it anyway. And if it's small, it's small. But I want to be able to say something to my culture about what relationships ought to look like. And in this ethnically tense time, this church has something to say. I have something to say. Now, I may not have all the answers. Nobody does. I don't know any experts on ethnic inclusion in this world. I don't know any. But I do know some who are very experienced. People that have lived it intentionally, not just by accident. There are a lot of churches that, that call themselves multi-ethnic, and I am grateful for it. We are at probably the best place we've ever been in our history in terms of multi-ethnic relations. 
and it's still bad. But we're at the best place where, where people can dwell together and, and be together. It's really cool. But some do it simply because it happens to be a representation of their community. We do it because we're trying to. So we talk about issues quite a bit here. We deal with stuff. When things affect our nation, I begin to talk, talk about it from the pulpit. I'll write letters to the congregation. We'll have forums with police officers coming in. And saying, how come this happened? Even though I am for the police, they've done some things that just aren't right. And so I've got to address them. I'm not throwing out the baby with the bathwater. I'm trying to figure out how to get a clean baby. Because I need my police to protect my community. Oh, wouldn't the criminals love? No police. Gosh. I want to make it better. In fact, I am serving on a committee in my area here, churches in Fairfax County, Virginia. I'm serving on a committee that goes and, and reviews the policies and procedures of the Fairfax County Police Department. And so I'm engaged in reform. I want to help. And they asked me to serve. My point is, we are a church that is giving answers to problems. Businesses are calling us, asking us to help them in their employee conflicts regarding this ethnic tension. And, and they don't know how to deal with it, but they know that we are intentional in the way we construct spiritual family and church. And so they say, come help us, please. I can't tell you how many organizations, including this one to whom I'm addressing today, are asking me for assistance. Why? Because we are relevant because we decided to build like this, I have some experience in how to keep it together and make it healthy. So that gives you some history as to why I might have something to say about where we are. Now, let me give you some history history, not just mine. Jamestown, 1619, colonists from Europe settle in what we now know as Virginia. And they bring with them or have imported to them about 20 slaves from Africa. That began the slave trade in what we would later call America. Um, the North was not immune to slavery, but they didn't practice it as frequently nor endorse it as much as the South did. And this is where it started. Somewhere in the history of our country, there became a huge divide between what was north and south and what was practiced in the north and what was practiced in the south. Uh, the Revolutionary War occurred, and uh, this, this newly formed nation called America won. In 1787, the framers of the Constitution some of the finest men who have ever lived, smart, really, really smart. And I admire what they have been able to construct in terms of freedoms. And though I admire them, I do not ignore their faults. And their flaws were huge. Namely, this one, slavery. I don't know except by way of pressure from the South, why in the world they gave in to this. Some were against it, many were for it, but the some who were against it weren't against it enough. And so in the Constitution, they framed people of African descent as being less than human. They called us three-fifths of a person. Therefore, we were property. I don't even know what three-fifths of a person is, because if you're human, you can't be less than. You can't be half man, or you are no man at all if you are. So I don't know what three-fifths of a person is, except that you just want to make sure that the taxes are appropriated well for the property that you have. And so my ancestors, my relatives, were just above a cow in terms of how America recognized them, a pig. What's really bad is, is that you never had to tell a pig it was a pig. You never had to tell a cow it was a cow. It knew. 
But America knew that these people they were enslaving were human. And so they had to regularly let them know they weren't by beating them. They didn't beat their cows by telling them what they weren't. They were less than. They weren't as educated. They weren't as smart. They didn't have the capabilities. Their DNA was inferior. They had to keep driving that home generation after generation after generation because they knew they were human and had inalienable rights. And they were intentionally depriving them of them. Sad. Really sad. And upon this construct, our nation was built. This nation was not made for me. The Constitution was not made for me. This nation was made on me. It was built on me. Black folks started to figure out loopholes. And in 1857, a man named Dred Scott, who was a slave of Mr. Sanford, Mr. Sanford had moved around from the south to the north, and they wound up in Illinois. Illinois was a free state, did not allow slavery. Dred Scott was his slave. Dred Scott decided, I'm in a free state. I shouldn't have to be a slave, so I'm going to go ahead and sue my owner. Wow, what a brave man. He was married with kids, Dred Scott was. And he knew he could be blasted, but he did it because he cared about his own, and he cared about people who were like him went all the way to, to the Supreme Court. And the Supreme Court said this, as Dred Scott was suing for his freedom being in a free state, he said, neither slaves nor the descendants of slaves, the Supreme Court said, neither slaves nor the descendants of slaves can ever be considered Americans. So they reinforced what they believed they had ensconced well in the Constitution. Now the Constitution is that which cannot be changed. At least, that's what's, what's said. It can be amended, but it cannot be changed. I wish it could be changed just to acknowledge us. He lost that decision reaffirming what America really thought about us. 1861, the Civil War starts. And the Dred Scott decision really formalized and galvanized the abolitionist movement in the North, which then got President Lincoln elected in 1860, which then made the South more entrenched in its culture of slavery, which caused their secession from the Union. So this decision, one way or the other, was going to split the nation, meaning the Dred Scott decision, and it did. In 1861, the Civil War starts. 1863, Lincoln, whether he cared about slaves or not, and I like to believe he did, um, or whether it was a, a tactic in order to get more people enlisted in the North, he wrote the Emancipation Proclamation, which freed the slaves from all over America. Well, remember, he was the Northern president fighting against a Southern uh, confederacy. Jefferson Davis was president of the South. The, the South didn't recognize anything that the North said. They were, they were at war with them. They didn't care. So even though the Emancipation Proclamation was signed, the South said, so? <laughs> slaves didn't go free, but the slaves heard about it, and, and, and they realized, if, if, if I can get free and go and fight for the North, I can secure my freedom by my fighting against my oppressor, and President Lincoln has also said anybody who does fight is free. So many slaves left their plantations and found some degree of harbor in the North. 1865, the Civil War ends. And with the end of the Civil War and the South defeated, you have Reconstruction in the South, and you have now the will of the North exerted however it wishes. So in 1865, the 13th Amendment is added to the Constitution, making all slaves, ratifying in terms of law now uh, and, and constitutional right, ratifying what Abraham Lincoln already said. 
All slaves are free, 13th Amendment. 1866, you have the 14th Amendment, making all slaves who, uh, all freed slaves, now citizens in America. And then in 69, you've got the ability for now black people to vote. I'm grateful for those three amendments, the 13th, 14th, and 15th. But I'm also mindful that America had to make them because the Constitution was not written for me. I think the Constitution is one of the most valuable documents in human history. It recognizes and acknowledges and preserves freedoms unlike any other document that men have wrote, have written. Forgive my poor English, but it was flawed. Black folks are beginning to to feel like they ought to be included in every facet of society. During the Reconstruction period in the South, where the North was now the occupying force, trying to figure out how to make sure that they enforced their will upon the South, um, it lasted, that Reconstruction period, for about 20 years or so, 15, 20 years, and then the North left. <clears throat> when the North left, the South decided to employ things called Jim Crow laws. Jim Crow laws were to make sure that black and white folk never really related, that they were, on, they were in separate areas. You had black restaurants and white restaurants. You had black bathrooms and white bathrooms. Black schools, white neighborhoods. Black schools, white schools. Black neighborhoods, white neighborhoods. And um, it seems that the South always made sure that they were separate and unequal. Now, black folks wanted to be integrated fully, uh, not only because they thought they should be integrated fully into the fabric of America, but because the white folk had more resources. The government made sure, whether it was the local government, state government, or city, uh, or, or national, they made sure the resources flowed to the dominant population. But somehow it never got to the other groups, never got to the black folk. And so it became separate and unequal. So unequal was it that a man named Plessy, Mr. Plessy, uh, decided he was going to test the law. And he was riding on a train in, out of New Orleans. And um, <clears throat> there were cars for black people in the back and cars for white people in the front. He decided to sit in the white folks section. <laughs> he got arrested. As a result of him being arrested, uh, he got fined, jailed, and uh, decided to take his thing to court appealed one after another until it made it to the Supreme Court. And the Supreme Court said this, that separate but equal is good, 1896. Separate but equal is right. I don't think that's right. But even, even if it was, America did not allow the resources to flow equally. And so it was always separate but unequal. This is just a thumbnail sketch of how we got here. Endure with me for another seven minutes, please. And that decision, Plessy versus Ferguson, 1896 in the Supreme Court, has never been changed. It has been assumed to be applied differently now, reversed by Brown versus Board of Education in 1954, whereby the, the Supreme Court said separate but equal is wrong in terms of education. And so black kids now can go to white institutions. They can be educated in white environments. That's what Brown versus Board of Education said. But it wasn't a reversal of Plessy versus Ferguson. It was an application to say that this particular law of, of separate but equal cannot be applied to schools. And because that law, that, that, that uh, decision from the courts came down in that area, people have applied it to every place else. But Plessy versus Ferguson itself has never been changed. It needs to be. Jim Crow laws continued until 1965. I was four when they were crushed. In the South, they continued. My grandparents lived in that environment. My dad grew up in, in that environment. In Tuskegee, Alabama, it it was horrible. I remember when I was a kid, Grandpa would never go to the, quote, white side of the town. We always stayed near the university, near the institute, and in the black side of town. He'd never go there. He'd drive around stuff. 
in order to make sure he shopped in the black areas. In 1921, everybody knows this now, the massacre in um, Greenwood, Tulsa, Oklahoma, a suburb. Greenwood was called the Black Wall Street. It was um, the most prosperous, arguably, the most prosperous black neighborhood in America. It was a freedman's town. It was a place where folks who were free uh, as a result of their freedom from slavery could now go and establish their own town. Remember, you couldn't go to a white place. You had to go to a black place. And this one here was built and constructed beautifully, economically, educationally, and every other way. Well, there was a man from Greenwood uh, who was accused of having a relationship with a white girl. Now, I don't even like to, w to use the word accused because... What's wrong with that? There's no crime there. But there's not even any proof that that was really the case. Yet, civil authorities, police, the uh, government of the, the town of Tulsa, and a mob came, destroyed the city of Greenwood, massacred 300 people, maimed more 10,000 residents in this city burned the city to the ground. Now, not only was nobody convicted in this crime, but nobody was even charged. The largest massacre of black people at one time in the history of our country, and it barely made the back page of the New York Times. You didn't even know about it until th this month. We knew. And this is, this is a lead-in. This is the on-ramp to letting you understand why in the world black folk aren't happy. Because we've known, we've lived in the environment of disrespect. Of people not caring about us. Of dehumanizing us of making sure that resources did not get to us. We've known this for the longest. We carry the pain of our ancestors and our own individual experience. And you're just now coming to know about it. The people of Greenwood went to their insurance companies and said, can you please pay out? My building was destroyed. The insurance company said this, sorry, it was a riot, loophole. We pay nothing. 1932, the um, diversion of health and human services um, went down, <clears throat> our, that version of health and human services went down to Tuskegee, Alabama to do some research on uh, some people who uh, were suffering with, with a disease. And they said they were there to help them. They called it a blood deficiency or a blood sickness. Um, and they said, if you sign up for this, we'll give you antidotes. We'll give you remedies to your sickness. Started in 1932, went all the way to 1972. I was 12. Over 600 men, they believe, were treated for this disease. Uh, but they were lied to because they were never treated. When an antidote for the sickness they had came, became available in 1947, the medical professionals there didn't even offer it to them. They gave them placebos because their research was to figure out how in the world this disease ravaged the body. How did it maim? How did it blind? How did it cause nerve disorder? How did these men suffer? And then they would chronicle it. For 40 years, they treated these African Americans now as guinea pigs. Our federal government. And you wonder why black people are mad. You see police officers doing horrible things to black men, black women. In broad daylight, we're not talking about lynchings 
that happened under the cover of darkness in Georgia or South Carolina. We're talking about in Minneapolis, in the, in the middle of the street. Why? Because he thinks he can get away with it. At some point, black people just say enough. Enough. When I, um, when I saw the, the things that were going on, um, my, my heart was pricked as it has been over every young black man or woman that has been murdered by police. Pastors called me trying to figure out how in the world they can I mean, process what's going on in our country as a result of five weeks ago in George Floyd's death by Officer Chauvin. And uh, one pastor called me, and, and he was really concerned. And he said, uh, Pastor, you know, I, I'm seeing things that are happening in our, in our world, and I, I'm so surprised. That, w w w were you surprised? I said, No. But I, but I tell you what I'm not surprised by, the fact that you actually asked me that question. And I said to him, I said, I'm grateful for the call, and we're going to have a really good conversation today, probably one that goes in a direction that you did not think it was going in. But please understand, you've been in the city for 30 years, and you've known me for 10. You've been senior pastor for 10, and you've known of me. You know this is the first time you've called me? And he said, well, you know, it was because I, I, didn't, I, I didn't know how to. I said, I get it. I'm, I'm not blaming you. I'm not blaming you. I just want you to, to know where we need to start the conversation. Because if you really want to grow through this rather than just go through this, you've got to know what the starting point is. You can't ignore some things. The reason you're calling me is because your world is being upset. You don't want riots to come to your neighborhood. You're concerned about your children walking to school. You're wondering whether organizations are going to march in your streets and your version of America is being upset. You're not calling me because George Floyd died. You're not calling me because Breonna Taylor died. You're not calling me because Eric Garner was choked out on the street. Those things happen. I never heard from you. And he began to cry on the other side. I'm, I said, I'm not trying to make you cry. I just want you to know where we need to start the conversation. That the reason you're calling me is because your world has been upset. My world has been this way from day one. You're not calling because you're concerned about people who look like me. You're calling because you're concerned about people who look like you. So we need to start the conversation at a different point than when you decided to call me. It's hard to have conversations like this, but it's helpful and it's needful. The protests that are going on and have gone on for the last five weeks are uncomfortable, but it's because black folks are just tired, just flat tired, and white folks haven't been listening, but it seems now their ears are open. And people are trying to figure out how in the world can I address this well in my world? What do I need to do to change? How can I adapt my life to make sense of this new reality? Because this isn't going to stop. This is going to go on. These millennials who are, who are driving this, this is their moment. This is their stamp on humanity to say we will make a difference and they're not going to quit until they do. And they are not going to leave one stone unturned. Whether it's the police department, whether it's civil authority, whether it's federal authority, whether it's state authority, whether it's your basketball program in your school, they will not leave one stone unturned. They're going to try to make their mark wherever they can. And it's incumbent upon you, dear coach, to figure out how in the world to transform your program and first your own life and your mind into something that makes sense in line with the reformations that are going on. Or else you're going to be swept up by them. You're going to be caught off guard. This snowball is rolling downhill in a hurry and it's getting bigger and bigger. I don't want you to be caught up in it and destroy it. Have your program altered 
in a way that, that is, is not helpful to you in your career or helpful to the people in your program. I want you to be ahead of the, the game. Your kids are coming to school in about six weeks. What are you going to say? How are you going to approach this? Your coaches, your assistant coaches are coming back. Many of them are, are African American. How are you going to approach this? I beg you, you can't ignore it. You better be able to say some things. You better be able to line some stuff up so that there is a, is a productive way that, that these players and coaches can express their opinions about what needs to change in our world. Let me say this. They're going to do it one way or another. And they're going to do it even if you produce a program because they want their individual voice to be heard. But, but there also ought to be something systemically that allows them to understand you as a head coach get it. Something in your program is being driven toward change and, and conversation and ethnic healing in your world. I live in the environment where I'm trying to constantly bring ethnic healing to our world. Now, let me tell you why I use terms that might be a little bit different than everybody else's. I inherited some things. Uh, from the civil rights movement, I inherited three words. Prejudice, racism, and bigotry. Prejudice, racism, and bigotry. And let me define those three. Prejudice is a prejudging of somebody's life before you know the facts. Generally, prejudice alone can be fixed with information. Once you find out something that makes you a little bit smarter, you've been upgraded, you say, oh, I didn't know. I was ignorant. Now I know. I'm not going to treat you that way. I'm not going to think that way anymore. Got it. Thank you so much. Bigotry is prejudice with malintent. It is somebody who actually has, a, has a, a, a predisposed hatred or thoughts that make somebody uh, put them in a category of being less than than the person who's thinking them. And so bigotry can't be fixed by information. It can only be fixed with a heart change. Racism is that which is bigotry or prejudice codified, meaning it was institutionalized. Somebody decided, I don't like you, and therefore, I do not want you living in my neighborhood, so I'm going to write laws that say that. You can't work in my, my place of employ. You can't go to my school. That's what racism was defined as. Today, it's different. Not different concepts, but different words. Prejudice is defined as unconscious or implicit bias. Bigotry is defined as racism, and institutionalized racism was defined, excuse me, racism was defined as institutionalized racism. And so we've got three different concepts for the same things in which that, that, that were handed down to me. And I don't mind the, the, the distinction and change in terms. I'm, I'm raising the white flag of surrender to the millennial generation and say, y'all take it, that's fine. As long as we're talking about applying the right solution to the right problem. Because people throw around the term racist, as, as it's, it's, it's almost like candy. Anything that somebody says that isn't ethnically sensitive, they say they're a racist. And I say, well, what do you mean by that? Because if you're talking about somebody who is implicitly biased or unconsciously biased, I don't apply the same solution to that as I would to a bigot. I have to know what you mean when you say that. Do you mean they have malintent and are trying to take you down and hate you? Is that what you mean? Or do you mean they actually just said something really stupid? And they need to be upgraded in their understanding. I apply different solutions to different problems. Please, coaches, have people define their words when they say things like this so that you know exactly what solution needs to be applied. And you make sure you define your words. Say the right thing. I use the term ethnic uh, rather than race simply because I don't like Charles Darwin. Just don't like him. And it has nothing to do with a personal dislike. It's the fact that he decided to codify, first one to codify the idea of racism and that his idea of evolution, which whether you agree with it or not, has this one flaw, this one flaw, and that he believed that black folks were on the downside in terms of progress of evolution and white folks were on the upper end. That white folks had actually, he had a monogenic idea about evolution. He believed that there was one gene pool from which we all came. He just thought the black folks were, were, were lesser developed than white, and that the European continent had come into its own as, and was at the pinnacle of its, of its formation, while black folks on the African continent were not. 
And that's when he decided there was a black race and a white race. Now, other people had used that term, but never in, in the idea that somehow black folks were less than. They just simply used it to define different people groups. Uh, in, in his origin of the species, he decided to codify it and say black people were less than. Therefore, I choose not to agree with Darwin ever. And I choose to use the word ethnic rather than race to define people groups because it defines them better in terms of my understanding of where they came from rather than being on this horrible ladder that, that, that defines different ethnic groups according to the strata that Darwin thought. Sorry for being angry. I don't like Darwin. These terms help us define how we ought to be, what we ought to do how the solutions ought to be applied to the certain situations. And as you come into your program, you're going to have to apply some solutions that go beyond just how to deal with the problem. Okay, There may be some implicit bias in your program, some people who are unconsciously biased in your program. There may be some racist tendencies in your program. And when I say that, I'm not talking about things you've codified and said black folk can't do this. I'm talking about a culture that may have been created that you don't even know exists simply because you live in the water of acceptance. That's all you know. We live in the water of trying to, to, to navigate through difficulty constantly. And we have to always be careful with our words or, or be careful with our actions because we're not trying to stir up things. We can't live mad every day. We have to pick and choose. It's not healthy to live mad. It's not healthy to try to upset the apple cart every day of our life. It's just not healthy. And so we have to pick and choose our battles. Now, some people might disagree with the strategy I've just uh, articulated, but that's, that's life. All of us are trying to make progress. Some of us just use different strategies. And I choose not to be mad every day, yet I choose to affect change every day in ways that are conciliatory in their orientation. You may have some that are cultural, not just codified. And, and other people can see it. You can't. You're culture blind. And so it's important for you to have others around and say, we've got to identify that. You're going to have to make some changes to your program probably. Here's one, education. Read. Read Parting the Waters. Great book. Read anything you can by MLK, Martin Luther King, Jr. Read uh, uh, Before the Mayflower. Ron Bennett. Wow, what a book. What a book. And have, a, have watch parties for your, your, uh, your, your, your athletes. Harriet movie. Fabulous. Harriet. Whoa. About Harriet Tubman. Amazing. 12 Years a Slave. That one there will make you mad, but it will give you a good sense of the culture that was created in the South and the North. Just Mercy. Great movie. Roots. Book and movie. Yeah, I know it's a boomer thing, 70s, but it's a great picture. My point is there are things you can do that are proactive. Secondly, you need to think about having a diversity officer in your world, a diversity specialist, if you will, somebody who can monitor the climate so that everybody feels included and unity is preserved. Um, I, I, think you, I think you can do some things with respect to having benefit games that will aid you in the process of supporting causes. Now, there are a lot of people out there who don't like BLM because they stand for so many things that don't seem to be mainstream in American thought. I get it. But remember, there are a lot of organizations out there, a lot of things that you support and, and recommend, though you do not endorse. I choose to say recommend, not endorse, when I can't fully support something. Uh, there are a lot of things that you recommend that you may not fully endorse, namely candidates. There might be 25 planks in a candidate's platform, 24 of them you hate, but there's one that makes you check his box or his or her box. My point is, BLM, Black Lives Matter, I get it. There are a lot of things I don't like about it, except those three words. Black Lives Matter. I'm glad somebody I'm glad somebody thinks my life matters. I really am. And then secondly, it's really, we got to be careful that we decry and get mad about a solution that may not be perfect when we didn't offer one. Black folks been 
been being killed by police for a long time. Look up Emmett Hill, 1954, 14-year-old, that was accused, again, accused, of having a relationship with a white woman. He was 14. He was found hung from a tree the next day. Black folks have been being killed by, by police for a long time, and that sometimes without, without any repercussions. If you don't like that, if you don't like the solution that's been established, why didn't you, why didn't you make one? Where were you when Eric Garner was killed? Why didn't you come up with one if you cared about us so much? It would have been probably a better solution than that which you're fighting now. I'm just saying, somebody cared enough to produce something. And although I may not agree with all of it, those three words, I'm on point. You need to come up with some ideas that allow your program to get healthy ethnically. Another thing you need to do with your program is develop some good ways of beginning conversations. Here's a white coach, white player. Here's a, a good way to start a conversation with a black man because you don't even know where to go. You don't know how to begin. Um, you start by saying, I feel your pain. You'll never understand it, but you can say you feel it. You empathize with them. Number two, I am really sorry for what people like me have done to people like you. Identification. Identification with the wrong so you can identify with the right, with those in the right. And then number three, what can I do to help? Those three statements allow for an on-ramp of conversation to begin that break down the defenses of every black person who is concerned about how he needs to be or how she needs to be in this environment or what you think or how they can approach you. And when those defenses are broken down, then you can have a profitable conversation about what next looks like. And I beg you, you employ those things, you'll be helped. One thing you shouldn't say, or a couple is, well, you know, I'm colorblind. Don't say that. Because if, if you say you're colorblind, that means you don't see me. And you, you have to see me, meaning you have to see what color has meant to me in my history. If you say you're colorblind, you're ignoring the things that have gone on. Now, I know what you're trying to say. You give no preference according to color. But when you say you're colorblind, you're saying you ignore all the stuff that America has done to me because of my color. You have to first understand me through that in order to relate to me well. Secondly, you know, some of my best friends were black. I have three or four black coaches. So <laughs> they may be tolerating you just like me. You might think they're your best friend, but I don't know if they're going to say that about you. You gain no credibility with me by telling me you have your, your friends out there who are black. Don't say those things. It doesn't help, white folk. Start with the three. I feel your pain. I'm sorry for what people who look like me have done to people who look like you. Three, how can I help? You do that, you begin a great on-ramp to conversation. And as I close... The world is demanding justice. And what Officer Chauvin did to George Floyd demands justice. He ought to pay for what he did. The consequences ought to be born in his life. But justice is not just that which needs to be applied to an individual officer. There's also a, a sociological justice that needs to be addressed. Why is it that African-American communities are more poor in general than white? Why is it that they are less educated than white? Why is it that they seem to have more violent encounters with police officers than the white community does? I live in, my church is in Fairfax County. 9%, 9.8% of Fairfax County is African-American, yet we make up 46% of the violent encounters. Sometimes a knee-jerk response by white folk is to say, well, that means that black folk just tend toward criminal activity more than white. Please don't go there. You're going to be in trouble. Impoverished communities all around the world seem to have a greater incident, greater incidence of criminal activity because people are trying to find resources they do not have. How is it the, that the African-American community has perpetually been in a state of bordering on poverty? How? Is it because black people are not motivated? 
No. And you might say, well, wait a minute now. We've got a black president, right? He was in Obama. We, we have people who are leading Fortune 500 companies, right? We, we have black senators. We have black congressmen. Hey, haven't you all risen up? Simply because a few broke through the, the ceiling, the concrete ceiling that America had put there, doesn't mean everybody has. And there's a whole community that we are trying to help. So how have we been this way? How did it get this way? Somehow or another, resources just haven't flown like they should have. And I'm not saying, well, I'm going to stop there. My point is that there ought to be there ought, to be some, there ought to be some justice with respect to what it looks like sociologically applied. And I have some answers. I don't want to give them now. But I'm just letting you know that justice is more than just the individual consequences that need to be borne by a person who committed wrong. There are also things that our nation ha has done. And we need to address those. And then lastly, as we talk about justice, please know this. That I'm not, I'm not stopping at justice. Justice needs to be meted out wherever injustice has prevailed. But I go from justice to reconciliation. Reconciliation fixes stuff. Justice finishes stuff. Justice finishes the process of making sure that someone who committed a wrong now suffers the penalty for their wrongdoing. But it doesn't fix anything. Reconciliation takes the broken pieces, the leftovers, and brings healing. It takes those who were enemies and now makes them friends. That's where I live. You can't get to true reconciliation until justice is meted out. But once it is, reconciliation allows things to be repaired. And I want my nation whole. I want your university whole. I want my community whole. And you can't get there just through punishing the wrongdoer. You get there by employing principles of forgiveness and love and tenderness. My life philosophy goes like this. I go from making people who are adversaries to allies. And then when I make them an ally, I bring them all the way to advocacy. That's my goal. If I can take an adversary and make them an ally and then take that ally and make them an advocate, I now have, have replicated my version of right even when I'm not around. And they now can be the voice of right when I can't speak. And if we do that regularly, we make our world better. I live in the environment of making friends out of enemies because I believe that's the highest degree of love Anybody can love somebody who loves them. It takes a real man, a real woman to love somebody who doesn't. That's where I live. And I hope you can fashion your program around those highest virtues and ideals. Thank you for listening to me today. I know it's been long, but I hope it's been helpful. I believe in what can be done and what our nation can live up to. Please be a part of that answer. Have a great day. Bless you.